Charles G. Finney, an autobiography, Fleming H. Ravel Company, Old Tappan, New Jersey. Printed in the United States of America, copyright the Trustees of Oberlin College, 1876, copyright renewed, 1908. This book was originally entitled, Memoirs of Charles G. Finney. Preface. The author of the following narrative sufficiently explains its origin and purpose in the introductory pages. He left the manuscript at the disposal of his family, having never decided in his own mind that it was desirable to publish it. Many of his friends, becoming aware of its existence, have urged its publication, and his children, yielding to the general demand, have presented the manuscript to Oberlin College for this purpose. In giving it to the public, it is manifestly, it is manifestly necessary to present it essentially as we find it. No liberties can be taken with it to modify views or statements which may sometimes seem extreme or partial, or even to subdue a style which, though rugged at times, is always dramatic and forcible. Few men have better earned the right to utter their own thoughts in their own words. These thoughts and words are what many friends of Mr. Finney will desire. The only changes that seemed allowable were occasional omissions to avoid unnecessary repetition, or too minute detail, or at times references that might seem too distinctly personal. The narrative is, in its very nature, personal, involving the experiences both of the author and of those with whom he had to do. And to these personal experiences, it, in great part, owes its interest and its value. As the narrative presents the memories and heart yearnings of a veteran pastor with a passion for winning souls, it is hoped and believed that in its personal references it will not be regarded as having transcended the limits of Christian propriety. For the most part, the lapse of time sets aside all question. Here and there, perhaps, the statements in the narrative may seem inadequate as involving only a partial view of facts. It will be remembered that such partial views belong to all personal observation and opinion, and each one will naturally supply the correction that seems to be demanded. Signed, J.H.F., Oberlin College, January 1876. The Memoirs of Charles G. Finney, Chapter 1, Birth and Early Education. It has pleased God in some measure to connect my name and labors with an intensive movement of the Church of Christ, regarded by some as a new era in its progress, especially in relation to revivals of religion. As this moment involved, to a considerable extent, the development of views of Christian doctrine which had not been common and was brought about by changes in the means of carrying forward the work of evangelization, it was very natural that some misapprehension should prevail in regard to these modified statements of doctrine and the use of these measures, and consequently that to some extent even good men should call and question the wisdom of these measures and the soundness of these theological statements and that ungodly men should be irritated and for a time should strenuously oppose these great movements. I have spoken of myself as connected with these movements, but only as one of the many ministers and other servants of Christ who have shared prominently in promoting them. I am aware that by a certain portion of the Church I have been considered an innovator, both in regard to doctrine and measures and that many have looked upon me as rather prominent, especially in assailing some of the old forms of theological thought and expression, and in stating the doctrines of the gospel in many respects in new language. I have been particularly importuned for a number of years by the friends of those revivals with which my name and labors have been connected to write a history of them. As so much misapprehension has prevailed respecting them, it is thought that the truth of history demands a statement from myself of the doctrines that were preached, so far as I was concerned, of the measures used, and of the results of preaching those doctrines and the use of those measures. My mind seems instinctively to recoil from saying so much of myself as I shall be obliged to do if I speak honestly of those revivals and of my relation to them. For this reason I have declined up to this time to undertake such a work. Of late, the trustees of Oberlin College have laid the matter before me and urged me to undertake it. They, together with numerous other friends in this country and in England, have urged that it was due to the cause of Christ that a better understanding should exist in the Church than has hitherto existed, 
in regard especially to the revivals that occurred in central New York and elsewhere from 1821 and onward for several years because those revivals have been most misrepresented and opposed. I approach the subject, I must say, with reluctance for many reasons. I have kept no diary and consequently must depend on my memory. It is true that my memory is naturally very tenacious and the events that I have witnessed in revivals of religion have made a very deep impression on my mind. And I remember with great distinctness many more than I shall have time to communicate. Everyone who has witnessed powerful revivals of religion is aware that many cases of conviction and conversion are daily occurring, of the greatest interest to the people in the midst of whom they occur. Where all the facts and circumstances are known, a thrilling effect is often produced. And such cases are frequently so numerous that if all the highly interesting facts of even one extended revival in a single locality should be narrated, it would fill a large volume. I do not propose to pursue this course in what I am about to write. I shall only sketch such an outline as will, upon the whole, give a tolerably clear idea of the type which these revivals took on, and shall only relate a few of the particular instances of conversion which occurred in different places. I shall also endeavor to give such an account of the doctrines which were preached and of the measures which were used, and shall mention such facts in general as will enable the Church hereafter, partially at least, to estimate the power and purity of those great works of God. But I hesitate to write a narrative of those revivals because I have often been surprised to find out how much my own remembrance of facts differs from the recollection of other persons who were in the midst of those scenes. Of course, I must state the facts as I remember them. A great many of those events have been often referred to by myself in preaching as illustrative of the truths that I was presenting to the people. I have been so often reminded of them and have so often referred to them in all the years of my ministry that I cannot but have strong confidence that I remember them substantially as they occurred. If I shall in any case misstate the facts or if any case if in any case my recollections shall differ widely from those of others, I trust that the Church will believe that my statements are in entire accordance with my present remembrance of those facts. I am now, in 1867 to 1868, 75 years old. Of course, I remember things that transpired many years ago more definitely than those of recent occurrence. In regard to the doctrines I preached, so far as I was concerned, and the means used to promote revivals, I think I cannot be mistaken. To give any intelligible account of the part which I was called to act in those scenes, it is necessary that I should give a little history of the manner in which I came to adopt the doctrinal views which I have long held and preached, and which, I, which have been regarded by many persons as objectionable. I must commence by giving a very brief account of my birth and early circumstances in education, my conversion to Christ, my study of theology, and my entering upon the work of the ministry. I am not about to write an autobiography, let it be remembered, and shall enter no farther into a relation of the events of my own private life than shall seem necessary to give an intelligible account of the manner in which I was led in relation to, the, to these great movements of the Church. I was born in Warren, Litchfield County, Connecticut, August 29, 1792. When I was about two years old, my father removed to Oneida County, New York, which was, at that time, to a great extent, a wilderness. No religious privileges were enjoyed by the people. Very few religious books were to be had. The new settlers, being mostly from New England, almost immediately established common schools, but they had among them very little intelligent preaching of the gospel. I enjoyed the privileges of a common school, summer and winter, until I was fifteen or sixteen years old, I believe, and advanced so far as to be supposed capable of teaching a common school myself, as common schools were then conducted. My parents were neither of them professors of religion, and I believe among our neighbors there were very few religious people. I seldom heard a sermon unless it was an occasional one from some traveling minister or some miserable holding forth of an ignorant preacher who would sometimes be found in that country. I recollect very well that the ignorance of the preachers that I heard was such that the people would return from meeting and spend a considerable time in irrepressible laughter at the strange mistakes which had been made and the absurdities which had been advanced. 
In the neighborhood of my father's residence, we had just erected a meeting house and settled a minister. When my father was induced to remove again into the wilderness, skirting the southern shore of Lake Ontario, a little south of Sackett's Harbor. Here again I lived for several years, enjoying no better religious privileges than I had in Oneida County. When about 20 years old, I returned to Connecticut, and from thence went to New Jersey and uh, near New York City, and engaged in teaching. I taught and studied as best I could, and twice returned to New England and attended a high school for a season. While attending the high school, I meditated going to Yale College. My preceptor was a graduate of Yale, but he advised me not to go. He said it would be a loss of time, as I could easily accomplish the whole curriculum of study pursued at that institution in two years, whereas it would cost me four years to graduate. He presented such considerations as prevailed with me, and as it resulted, I failed to pursue my education any farther at the time. However, afterward, I acquired some knowledge of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. But I was never a classical scholar and never possessed so much knowledge of the ancient languages as to think myself capable of independently criticizing our English translation of the Bible. The teacher to whom I have referred wished me to join him in conducting an academy in one of the southern states. I was inclined to accept his proposal with the design of pursuing and completing my studies under his instruction. But when I informed my parents, whom I had not seen for four years, my contemplated movement south, uh, when I informed them of my contemplated movement south, they both came immediately after me and prevailed on me to go home with them to Jefferson County, New York. After making them a visit, I concluded to enter as a student the law office of Squire W. at Adams in that county. This was in 1818. Up to this time, I had never enjoyed what might be called religious privileges. I had never lived in a praying community except during the periods when I was attending the high school in New England, and the religion in that place was of a type not at all calculated to arrest my attention. The preaching was by an aged clergyman, an excellent man, and greatly beloved by the and venerated by his people, but he read his sermons in a manner that left no impression whatever on my mind. He had a monotonous, humdrum way of reading what he had probably written many years before. To give some idea of his preaching, let me say that his manuscript sermons were just large enough to put in a small Bible. I sat in the gallery and observed that he placed his manuscript in the middle of his Bible and inserted his fingers at the places where were to be found the passages of Scripture to be quoted in the reading of his sermon. This made it necessary to hold his Bible in both hands and rendered all gesticulation with his hands impossible. As he proceeded, he would read the passages of Scripture where his fingers were inserted, and thus liberate one finger after another until the fingers of both hands were read out of their places. When his fingers were all read out, he was near the close of the sermon. His reading was altogether unimpassioned and monotonous, and although the people attended very closely and reverentially to his reading, yet I must confess it was to me not much like preaching. When we retired from meeting, I often heard the people speak well of his sermons, and sometimes they would wonder whether he had intended any allusion in what he said to what was occurring among them. It seemed to be always a matter of curiosity to know what he was aiming at, especially if there was anything more in his sermon than a dry discussion of doctrine. And this was really quite as good preaching as I had ever listened to in any place. But anyone can judge whether such preaching was calculated to instruct or interest a young man who neither knew nor cared anything about religion. When I was teaching in New Jersey, the preaching in the neighborhood was chiefly in German. I do not think I heard half a dozen sermons in English during my whole stay in New Jersey, which was about three years. Thus, when I went to Adams to study law, I was almost as ignorant of religion as a heathen. I had been brought up mostly in the woods. I had very little regard to the Sabbath and had no definite knowledge of religious truth. At Adams, for the first time, I sat statedly for a length of time under an educated ministry. Reverend George W. Gale from Princeton, New Jersey, became, soon after I went there, pastor of the Presbyterian Church in that place. His preaching was of the old school type, that is, it was thoroughly Calvinistic, and Whenever he came out with the doctrines, which he seldom did, he would preach what has been called hyper-Calvinism. He was, of course, regarded as highly, highly orthodox. 
but I was not able to gain very much instruction from his preaching. As I sometimes told him, he seemed to me to begin in the middle of his discourse and was to assume many things which, to my mind, needed to be proved. He seemed to take it for granted that his hearers were theologians and, therefore, that he might assume all the great and fundamental doctrines of the gospel. But I must say that I was rather perplexed than edified by his preaching. I had never until this time lived where I could attend a stated prayer meeting. As one was held by the church near our office every week, I used to attend and listen to the prayers, but as often as, often as I could be excused from business at that hour. In studying elementary law, I found the old authors frequently quoting the scriptures and referring especially to the Mosaic Institutes as authority for many of the great principles of common law. This excited my curiosity so much that I went and purchased a Bible, the first I had ever owned, and whenever I found a reference by the law to the authors, uh, a reference by the law authors to the Bible, I turned to the passage and consulted it in its connection. This soon led to my taking a new interest in the Bible, and I read it and meditated on it much more than I had ever done before in my life. However much of it, I did not understand. Mr. Gale was in the habit of dropping in at our office frequently and seemed anxious to know what impression his sermons had made on my mind. I used to converse with him freely, and I now think that I sometimes criticized his sermons unmercifully. I raised such objections against his positions as forced themselves upon my attention. In conversing with him and asking him questions, I perceived that his own mind was, as I thought, mystified and that he did not accurately define to himself what he meant by many of the important terms that he used. Indeed, I found it impossible to attach any meaning to many of the terms which he used with great formality and frequency. What did he mean by repentance? Was it a mere feeling or of sorrow for sin? Was it altogether a passive state of mind, or did it involve a voluntary element? If it was a change of mind, in what respect was it a change of mind? What did he mean by the term regeneration? What did such language mean when applied to a spiritual change? What did he mean by faith? Was it merely an intellectual state? Was it merely a conviction or persuasion that the things stated in the gospel were true? What did he mean by sanctification? Did it involve any physical change in the subject or any physical influence on the part of God? I could not tell, nor did he seem to me to know himself in what sense he used these and similar terms. We had many, a great many, interesting conversations, but they seemed rather to stimulate my own mind to inquiry rather than to satisfy me in respect to the truth. But as I read my Bible and attended the prayer meetings, heard Mr. Gale preach and conversed with him, with the elders of the church and with others from time to time, I became very restless. A little consideration convinced me that I was by no means in a state of mind to go to heaven if I should die. It seemed to me that there must be something in religion that was of infinite importance, and it was soon settled with me that if the soul was immortal, I needed a great change in my inward state to be prepared for happiness in heaven. But still my mind was not made up as to the truth or falsehood of the gospel and of the Christian religion. The question, however, was of too much importance to allow me to rest in any uncertainty on the subject. I was particularly struck with the fact that the prayers that I had listened to from week to week were not, that I could see, answered. Indeed, I understood from their utterances in prayer and from other remarks in their meetings that those who offered them did not regard them as answered. When I read my Bible, I learned what Christ had said in regard to prayer and answers to prayer. He had said, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. I read also what Christ affirms, that God is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him, than earthly parents are to give good gifts to their children. I heard them pray continually for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and as often confess that they did not receive what they asked for. They exhorted each other to wake up and be engaged and to pray earnestly for a revival of religion, asserting that if they did their duty, prayed for the outpouring of the Spirit, and were in earnest that the Spirit of God would be poured out, that they would have a revival of religion, and that the impenitent would be converted. 
But in their prayer and conference meetings, they would continually confess substantially that they were making no progress in securing a revival of religion. This inconsistency, the fact that they prayed so much and were not answered, was a sad stumbling block to me. I knew not what to make of it. It was a question in my mind whether I was to understand that these persons were not truly Christians and therefore did not prevail with God, or did I misunderstand the promises and teachings of the Bible on this subject, or was I to conclude that the Bible was not true? Here was something inexplicable to me, and it seemed at one time that it would almost drive me into skepticism. It seemed to me that the teachings of the Bible did not at all accord with the facts which were before my eyes. On one occasion, when I was in one of the prayer meetings, I was asked if I did not desire that they should pray for me. I told them no, because I did not see that God answered their prayers. I said, I suppose I need to be prayed for, for I am conscious that I am a sinner, but I do not see that it will do any good for you to pray for me. For you are continually asking, but you do not receive. You have been praying for a revival of religion ever since I have been in Adams, and yet you have it not. You have been praying for the Holy Spirit to descend upon yourselves, and yet complaining of your business, of your leanness, excuse me. I recollect having used this expression at that time. You have prayed enough since I have attended these meetings to have prayed the devil out of Adams, if there is any virtue in your prayers. But here you are praying on and complaining still. I was quite in earnest in what I said, and not a little irritable, I think, in consequence of my being brought so continually face to face with religious truth, which was a new state of things to me. But on farther reading of my Bible, it struck me that the reason why their prayers were not answered was because they did not comply with the revealed conditions upon which God had promised to answer prayer, that they did not pray in faith in the sense of expecting God to give them the things that they asked for. This thought, for some time, lay in my mind as a confused questioning rather than in any definite form that could be stated in words. However, this relieved me so far as queries about the truth of the gospel were concerned, and after struggling in that way for some two or three years, my mind became quite settled that whatever mystification there might be either in my own or in my pastor's mind or in the mind of the church, the Bible was, nevertheless, the true word of God. This being settled, I was brought face to face with the question whether I would accept Christ as presented in the gospel or pursue a worldly course of life. At this period of my mind, as I have since known, I was so much impressed by the Holy Spirit that I could not long leave this question unsettled, nor could I long hesitate between the two courses of life presented to me.